morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first session in our new Tips and Tricks series, Security versus Compliance with Anthony Israel Davis. I'm Liz Fox, Senior Marketing Events Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's event. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You'll notice that there are several widgets at the bottom of the screen. Here, you can engage with fellow participants via the group chat, access resources, and suggest topics for future Tripwire Tips and Tricks sessions. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please click on the Help widget. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. Our speaker will remain on the line to answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand webcast at the conclusion of the webinar. So now, let's get on with the event. Our today's speaker, Anthony Israel Davis, has been with Tripwire for over two decades and is a senior manager of SaaS Ops, helping to deliver Tripwires from the cloud solutions. During his tenure, he's worked as a web developer, managed the business applications team, helped develop the security awareness program, and led IT compliance initiatives, including SOX PCI DCS, CSS, and SOX 2. So now, without further delay, I will turn it over to Anthony. All right. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate that. That was back. Uh, I needed a haircut back then, and I desperately need one now. This quarantine has been uh, great for my hair growth. So uh, before we get started, so this is tips and tricks, uh, although I don't think there are going to be any tricks. Uh, I've found that there is no one weird trick uh, to compliance. It just doesn't work that way. But there are a lot of things that we can do for success. Uh, but before we get started, one of the things that I would love for this to be is uh, communal. Uh, everybody on the line here has expertise, you have got experience, you've got great questions, you've got great answers. So I'm going to present the things that have been successful for me. Uh, but if there's something that uh, like tickles your mind that you want to throw out there, uh, feel free to throw that in the group chat. So there's a group chat button along the bottom. If you open that up, uh, you can throw out questions, you can throw out comments. Uh, in fact, uh, feel free to say hello. So where are you from? Are you somewhere in North America? Are you outside of North America? I'd love to hear that to see if there's somebody calling in from outside. Uh, so feel free to say hello. Uh, the chat lines are open. So that is for you. Um, and I'll be watching that as we go. So if I see something interesting, um, I've got my prepared slides. But if something becomes interesting to the group, uh, we can go in that direction. Uh, we don't have to stick to the slides. Uh, this is this is our time. It's our first tips and tricks, so we're trying this out, um, uh, and I'd love to hear from you. So again, drop in your, your questions, drop in your comments. Uh, if there's a question there that you can answer, feel free to answer it in the chat. I'm okay with that. Um, also, keep the discussion going. So over at forums.tripwire.com uh, in our customer center, uh, we have a thread going. Athens, oh my gosh, somebody is dialing in from Athens, Greece. That's, that's amazing. That's awesome. I love that. Um, so yeah, forums.tripwire.com. I've got a thread there. Uh, I'm going to post the Q&As there. So if you miss a question, I'm going to post the questions and answers there afterward. If there's additional questions or comments, uh, throw those in. Oh my goodness. Uh, wow, we've got people from all over the world. I've got the UK, I've got Istanbul, uh, Quebec. Man, this is, this is fantastic. Uh, greetings. Thank you for attending. I, I really appreciate it. Um, if anything that you, that you think of that comes up that didn't get answered or you want to talk about, forums.tripwire.com. We'll keep the conversation going. Uh, we only have you know an hour at, at most here, but we can keep this going. This is a great discussion. Um, oh, man, I love the participation already. Great. So, again, feel free to throw in questions, comments there. I'll try to keep up. If I miss something, that's fine. Uh, we'll catch it at the forums. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, the one big thing. So I uh, recently recorded a presentation for a, co uh, a conference here called Interface, uh, Interface Portland. And I wanted, if you like get this and then have to leave after that, get this. So security and compliance are a partnership. So that is, uh, for me, the biggest thing to, to take away that you've got a ton of people in your organization. You've got security. You've got your auditors, internal and external. You've got your compliance team. You've got IT, 
HR, which isn't on here, dev teams. There's an entire ecosystem and it's a partnership. So oftentimes when you talk about compliance or audit, it can feel adversarial. Somebody's coming in to ask you for documents, reports, screenshots, interviews. They're trying to take time from the things that you uh, are, are doing day to day. But the uh, important thing to take away is that time away is actually valuable. It's good. The thing that you're offering, your expertise, your reports, uh, that's a par partnership. And so the attitude, the way we approach compliance, the way we approach security uh, is going to affect the way that uh, compliance and that audit turns out. So uh, approach this as a, a partnership, approach this as a team, uh, and uh, that'll be successful. So if you, could, if you have to leave right now and you take away the partnership uh, approach, then that's the one thing I want you to take away. There'll be more, but I wanna throw that out at the very beginning because to me, that's the most important thing. So we succeed uh, as a team, uh, absolutely. All right, so as we get into this, I wanna talk about security and compliance. And I'm gonna actually make this a little bit personal because recently we had uh, a gap analysis for one of our services. We we're looking at, okay, what, does, what would it take to make that PCI compliant? Um, and you might have different compliance requirements. There's all kinds of stuff. There's, there's financial compliance, there's HIPAA, GDPR, uh, we've got NIST, ISO 27001. I don't know what your compliance needs are, uh, but uh, they all share a common theme. And that compliance is one thing and security is the other, but they're both trying to solve the same problem. They're trying to reduce risk. Um, so we had this gap analysis for PCI and we started talking to the developers and the, the people responsible going through the systems, going through all the requirements. And they're talking about the secure development life cycle and the software development life cycle. They're talking about uh, the scanning and the network segmentation, all the things we had to do. And as we're going through, uh, our consultant, auditor at the time, was uh, making all the notes. And it turns out that we had a pretty good secure system and our security was really solid we're doing all the right things but we wouldn't pass compliance whoops ah the compliance portion was uh on the other side of the bridge the other side of the gap why was that well we had documentation that we needed to update or create we had a few things that we needed to do um so security and compliance while we provided a secure environment, it wasn't necessarily compliant to this particular framework. Um, and you'll see at the top, I said verbs and a gap analysis. And the reason uh, I use the word verbs is because security has a bunch of things that it does. And compliance has a bunch of things that it does, verbs, things that they do. So security, they protect, they detect, they prevent, uh, they do things to keep the environment safe. So their verbs are all about protecting the data security of the environment. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're compliant. Compliance has a, a few other things that they do. They're going to audit, they're going to test, they're going to assure. Uh, and the teamwork in that is that security is trying to make things secure and safe. And compliance is wanted, wanting to make sure that what they're doing is actually what they say. Uh, is it secure? Is it happening at the frequency that we want it to do? Are we checking the scans? So they're providing assurance that the security controls that are in place are actually working. So together they form this partnership which allows the risk to be uh, reduced considerably. So security and compliance work together uh, as a partnership. And I think that that's often the case. But sometimes there's an adversarial relationship, uh, not only with compliance and security, but with the rest of the teams that I saw that I showed at the previous script slide. And so um, working together, uh, we're able to become secure and compliant. So there was a gap there. So there are differences. Um, so how do we bridge that gap? So the first thing that I like to say is auditors are your friend. And this is a theme that you're going to ha see throughout this. Um, auditors are your friends, uh, or at least they're partners. 
So a lot of times, and I mentioned this, it can seem adversarial. Somebody's coming in. They're asking you a bunch of invasive questions. They want to see documentation. But the one uh, key to success that I found is I approach that as an opportunity. So the auditors are doing an audit. Not uh, They're not auditing. They're not, it's not having something that's happening to us, right? I'm not having an audit. It's not ha happening to me. It's happening for me, and it's happening with me. So they're coming in, and they're helping me assure that my environment is meeting its compliance commitments. We've committed to be compliant. We've committed to be secure, and they're helping us do that. They're doing an inspection and helping us understand, are we meeting our commitments? And when I've approached my audits as uh, a friendly engagement, um, they've gone extremely well. Um, in terms of also just the way we approach that, way we talk about it. So um, I say that my auditor is here to help us um, as opposed to like in the gap analysis, I didn't do a good job. And I'll talk about this next. I didn't do a good job. And so they felt like they were thrown to the wolves. Well, our auditors aren't wolves. They're not going to eat you. Uh, they're actually here just to find out information and report about what they found. So we've asked them to do that. They're helping us out. Uh, so how we approach that, how we deal with compliance really affects that whole entire ecosystem. And so uh, let me then approach my next tip. So prepare your people. Um, and this is where I didn't do a good job in that gap analysis. I didn't prepare the people who were going to attend to what was going to happen. Uh, they didn't know what to expect, and so they weren't really prepared for the questions, and they felt uh, under the lights. And so if we want to have a successful compliance engagement, successful audit engagement, um, prepare your people. Let them know what's going to happen. So, and I've just did this with our, our group for our audit, which is starting next week. Let them know what's going to happen. There's going to be interviews. You're the experts. You know your system better than the auditor knows that. So they're going to ask you about that. Uh, they're going to ask you about these particular areas. So that if you're the expert on vulnerability assessment, they're going to ask you about your vulnerability assessment practices or your file integrity management practices. They're going to interview you and ask you about that. They're also going to ask for evidence. So I wanted, I wanted to let them know that they're going to ask for proof about these things. So they're going to want screenshots. They're going to want reports. They're going to want documentation. So these are the types of things we're going to look for. So now they're feeling prepared going into next week. The auditor is going to ask them, and they're going to know what to expect. I also wanted to let them know what the schedule was. We're going to start next week. Uh, and as we start, we're going to have a kickoff, and then you're going to be interviewed uh, these days, so maybe Tuesday. We'll need an hour or two of your time. So they're already ready to go. So now they're feeling confident. They're feeling comfortable. And when they get in that audit situation, it goes very smoothly, uh, and they know what they're talking about. That also just helps the overall results of the audit. So when those reports come out, they, they recognize they know what they're talking about. They understood the questions. They were prepared. They provided the evidence. It really does affect that whole audit experience and their compliance. And the last thing I like to say is it's conversation and not an interrogation. Oh, do we have? Music playing? I don't hear music, so uh, hopefully there's no music. But if there is, I hope it's good music. Uh, so if, if you've got music, maybe we want to turn that off. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's see. What else? Oh, yeah, it's a conversation and not an interrogation. So uh, the auditor's coming in to ask, and when they want to ask – questions and they probe deeper. They're not trying to dig in and find what's wrong. They just want to understand what's what's going on in your system. Oh, classical music's good. Um, so hopefully it's providing a nice ambiance for this and not too distracting. So uh, We'll see if we can get that taken care of. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for letting us know. Um, okay, next tip. So this is one that I've gotten a huge amount of value about, um, and I've actually written a couple of blog posts about it. I like it so much. So the Verizon Payment Security Report, and in fact, I wrote a blog saying it's not about PCI, and it really, really, really isn't just for PCI. So yes, it is the Payment Security Report. Yes, they talk about uh, the PCI standard, 
but there is so much value packed into this. I rec I, I highly recommend that uh, you you download this and you get uh, the value out of it. And you can download past reports, so you can get 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. So you can actually get the older reports, and I recommend that because each report digs into different aspects of the payment security or your data security environment. Um, and it's great not just for uh, compliance, but it's great for security. And let me give you an example of that. The PSR has a framework that they have uh, laid out called the 954 framework. Um, and this is a really good way to understand your security environment, your compliance environment, find uh, areas of improvement and uh, ways that you can then uh, advance the maturity of your data security program. Um, and I, I really appreciate what they've done here. So recommend that. So the nine, whoops, extra clicking. Let's try that again. So the nine, so 954, the nine factors of control effectiveness. So they lay out nine areas, the nine factors that help you establish your controls. As you can see from a security standpoint, is your control, are they designed well? Uh, what's the control risk? What's the control environment like? And so they go through that. And I'm not going to go into detail here because they're in the report, but it's give you a sense of the types of things that are in there. Um, but my favorite part is not the nine, but it's the five. Uh, and it's the five constraints. So the five constraints of organizational proficiency. And the reason I really like this is it's not just uh, applicable to this framework or this model, but it's applicable for thinking about any time you've got a constraint. And they talk about capacity. So do you even have the money, the time, the people to perform whatever it is you happen to be performing? If you have the people, do you have the capability? Are they able to do the the tasks? Are they able to do the things that are required of them? And that's true of technology as well. Do you have the technology? Uh, uh, do you, are they, is it capable of performing the task that you need to perform? And then competence. So you might have the capacity and capability, but do you have the competence uh, to do the things that you need to do? So you might have uh, skill in one area, but not as much experience in the other. And so you might have a lower level of competence or how well are you able to do the thing uh, in one area versus the other. Um, and again, you can use these to assess those nine factors uh, and then the four when I get to that as well. And commitment. So you've got the capacity, you've got the capability, you've got the competence, but do you have the commitment? If you've got a VP or a CISO that is not committed, it's going to be really hard to manage that uh, compliance. The same thing is if you've got uh, a security analyst. If they're not committed, uh, it just makes it that much harder. That can actually be a bottleneck. That could be a constraint to zero success. How much commitment do we need to build into the system for whatever it is you need to accomplish? And finally, communication. Communication can also be a constraint because if we're not communicating across horizontally, so business units or groups or teams, again, go, goes back to that team uh, theme that I've tried to talk about, so the, the theme of the team, but also uh, the uh, vertical communication. So do you have good communication up and down? So are, from the VP down to the line level uh, folks, what's your communication? How's the constraint? That's going to be something that's going to impact your, your bottleneck. Um, up, and I've got a request to zoom the page. I don't know if I can. Let me see. I'll try. Um, okay, and those are the five constraints. Um, and finally, the four of the 954, the four lines of assurance. So individual accountability, uh, risk management and compliance, internal audit, and external audit. So those are the four lines. So each of those is a has a constraint, but they also apply to each of the nine factors. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, to me, this framework, this model has been a really great way to uh, assess the data security and the, and the compliance environment um, for not only a point in time, but for a sustainable program. Because when it comes to compliance, it doesn't stop. It's 24 hours. It's continuous. And so it's not just a matter of I've got an audit once a year, but how do I manage that continuous compliance year after year? And this uh, really builds a nice framework for that. So I really appreciate 
uh, what they've done here. So I, I recommend going out and, and downloading that. Um, this is a very tactical t tip. Um, so minding the calendar uh, and frequency bound controls. Now I'm going to assume that um, a lot of you know, already know this, uh, but maybe you don't and this, you're, you're new to compliance. So I'm not sure where you're at from compliance and security versus compliance, but the frequency bound controls. So these are things that have to happen at a regular interval. Maybe it's once a year, maybe it's once a quarter, uh, maybe it's once a month. Those controls uh, are critical to your compliance. And those are the types of controls that if you miss one, you can't go back in time and change it. So if you've got a quarterly firewall review that has to happen or a six month firewall review that has to happen and you miss one, you can't go back in time. So what I recommend is you just double that. So if it is quarterly, do it monthly. Uh, if it's monthly, maybe not weekly, you know, it, where it's feasible, because some of those annual controls can be pretty onerous, right? Going through your security policy and making sure that everybody uh, att attests to the security policy. That can be pretty big, but say your firewall rules, a review ha is required to happen every six months, do it quarterly. Um, and the reason I recommend that is because things happen. People get sick, people go on vacation, people get promoted. Uh, you might have a huge project that's taking time away and it's easy to, to miss those things. So if you build that routine in and you double that up, you won't miss that frequency bound control and you won't have a finding that is something that you can't make up. So um, I found that to be uh, an extremely useful tip to make sure that I'm meeting my compliance requirements. But also, uh, more often for a lot of those things, also just means I, it's a smaller amount, so I have to take less time to do it. And, and it goes by uh, quicker and it's easier to do. So if I'm reviewing firewall rules, uh, reviewing uh, six months or four months or three months versus six months uh, is a big difference. And it, it makes that process a lot easier for us. And we can get it done in, in less time. All right. Next tip, create the control matrix. Now this is something you might have already done as well. So do you have a control matrix? Uh, so you might have a set of requirements, but do you have your own controls? Um, I know that when I had to do this for SOC 2, it was so useful because I knew exactly everything I had to do. Um, and I can just hand that to the auditor and I can manage that year over year and I refresh that year over year. In fact, I'll talk about that um, next. So in that control matrix, there are already controls out there. CIS has a nice, really intro one. So if you don't have one, starting with the CIS, 20 critical security controls, it's a good start. So those uh, are laid out in priority order. So you can take those top six basic controls and attack those first um, and gradually build that out. Um, and that's great for a security program and a compliance program. So if you're just starting out, CIS is a great way to start. NIST has the NIST 853, huge document, uh, made big document created by the US federal government, over 400 controls, really good, really comprehensive, uh, maybe hard to grasp if you're just starting out, but a huge uh, resource. So even if you're just starting out, you can go uh, online to NIST 853 and download those and that will help give you an idea of what the control set looks like. And of course, PCI has its requirements. So if you've got a, like a requirements one through 12, there's several controls in there. Using those as a baseline is a good start too. Um, and as you develop your, your control matrix, uh, make sure that every control has an ID so you can reference it, what the control is, the description of it. You might want to add in frequency. So is it an ad hoc control, a continuous control, an annual control, and the role. So who's responsible for that particular control? Who's doing it on a regular basis? Uh, and that's really helpful come audit time. Uh, it's also helpful for you to make sure that as an internal audit or internal compliance person, that you're making sure that you're able to go through and make sure all those things are happening, particularly those frequency bound controls because you can't miss those. Um, but that that's really helpful. Um, and uh, I found that that control matrix, it's really good to make sure you're looking at that at an annual basis. So if you've got an audit coming up three to six months ahead of that audit, you've gone through that, you make sure that they're they're still accurate, that nothing has changed, um, and that also preps your mind for that audit, so you make sure you're doing those things. So it's a good touch point uh, as you're going through, making sure that all your controls are being met 
and uh, you're prepared for any audit that's coming up. All right, uh, we're all ready to Q&A. Um, I went through that pretty quickly, but I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for Q&A. Those are the things that I came up with. I know that you've got a lot of stuff out there. Uh, you've got questions. You've got answers. So I would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, and again, we can continue this conversation on the forums. So if, if there's more stuff we want to talk about, uh, I'd love to do that there. So let's see what we've got uh, for questions. Um, what are the automation challenges? That's a great question. So I've got a question here about automation challenges. I'm trying to manage my technology. This is my first time doing this. Uh, all right, <laughs> cool. Um, what are the automation challenges? How much of the compliance process is automated? That is a great question. So um, I would say uh, automation, if we can automate as much as possible, right? So it really depends on where you're going, but there's a lot of things that you can automate. So like vulnerability assessment, that's easy to automate, right? You set your, your scan frequency, those happen and uh, on a regular basis and, you've, and you're reviewing those. So anything you can automate, you should. There's some things that are really hard to automate like documentation, right? So if you can somehow automate documentation, that's great. Can you do have readmes? So I know that for us, uh, like for our Git repository, we have readmes. That's a great place for documentation. So I love that um, in terms of a place where our documentation occurs. But what else for automation? So I'd love to hear what people have for automation in the chat, um, but your a lot of your technical controls, those are obviously uh, things that you should target for automation. You don't want to do uh, as manual log reviews. Uh, you have to do some of that, but you don't want to be doing everything manually, right? So um, what are the automation challenges? Uh, documentation is definitely an automation challenge uh, and most time consuming. Um, we try to automate things like um, attestations. So everybody's got to sign the, the ethics uh, requirements every year. They've got to sign their security policy every year in as much automation of that as possible. Um, here's another great question. How have you balanced uh, compliance versus enabling IT business to continue forward? That one's a huge challenge, can be a huge challenge. And that's why when I talk about team, it really does have to be a team. So like, for instance, uh, one of the biggest like um, business flows separation of duties, segregation, segregation of duties can feel like a really big barrier, right? Uh, I, can, I can't touch production, so how am I supposed to do DevOps? Um, so that's uh, an area where I found that we really have to negotiate with the business units, particularly like dev um, or IT to say, okay, here's the letter of the law, here's the spirit of the law, how can we come together to make sure that we meet that? Um, and one of the ways that we've done that is we've worked with our auditors as well. And we'll say, okay, this is what your compliance standard says. This is what we're doing. Is that going to pass the audit? And if not, what, what do we need to do? Um, uh, that's, that's one way that I found to be successful. Um, the other thing that I found to be successful is um, narrowing the scope. So can something be scoped out? So we want to be as we want to mitigate as much risk as possible. But sometimes taking uh, something out of scope is the way forward from a business perspective. And that's really a risk discussion with your risk managers. But can you take something and either reduce the scope or, or take it out of scope entirely? Um, and that's a hard discussion because uh, some things you, you just can't. Um, and so ultimately, it's a negotiation with uh, everybody involved. And the business needs to decide what's more important, uh, the particular compliance requirement or business speed, uh, velocity, and flow. And that's a challenge. Uh, and I don't have a good answer for that other than uh, absolutely need to um, negotiate that. Uh, let's see. Do we have any other questions? I'm not seeing any others. What other questions are out there? Let me see if there's anything in chat. <laughs> some great chat in here. Thank you. I really appreciate the interaction. Oh, okay. I've got one. 
Oh, fantastic. Thanks, thanks for adding more in the chat. So uh, this is a good, great question. What are the common IT frameworks out there that are that uh, that program can leverage? Uh, so like confidentiality, integrity, availability of information and information systems. So common IT frameworks, great. So I mentioned CIS, the Center for Internet Security. I think that is a good start just from a security uh, overview. Um, and I think that that applies to IT as much as uh, just security in general. So it really does talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And they, the, the nice thing about the CIS top 20, the, uh, and they're readily available. So you can, if you just go into Google, you know, CIS uh, top 20, that will come right up. Uh, I absolutely recommend doing that, that they have the top six. They're in priority order. Pick one and go after it, uh, right? So vulnerability assessment. Okay, we can do that. What do we need to do to, for vulnerability assessment? Or an asset inventory. What do we need to do for asset inventories? Grabbing that, and, and if you get one control and you had zero, you're now that much closer, you, you're that much better off, right? So you've made progress. So that's CIS is a good one to start with. Um, I did mention NIST. NIST is huge, um, but what you can do with a framework like NIST 853 is look through the areas and find the ones that are most accessible to you. Uh, there's a lot there, and sometimes the language is really hard to grasp, uh, just the way they're written. But find things that you think can make your compliance or your security uh, environment better. What can you do to make that just a bit better than it is today because it's a constant uh it's a constant growth right you're constantly making things better uh day to day um and if you made one step you're one step more than you were yesterday so i, I absolutely recommend doing that um if there are other frameworks that people are using uh that are like really like for like common uh i know that there are several out there that you're using uh, throw that in the chat um i'd love to hear that I wonder what are you using um, you know, PCI has its requirements, so that kind of gives you like that's what they're looking for for data security. Uh, those are the ones I'm familiar with. Um, you might have Sarbanes Oxley, which is uh, SOX, doesn't really give you a good framework to work with, and they use like Cobit. Uh, so Cobit, I know, certainly used uh, ISO 27001, um, but they're big. So I'd say start for something that you can consume uh, rather than something gigantic because that could be hard. Um, more great questions. Love these. These are coming in. So younger startup companies starting to understand their security posture. Any suggestions or advice as to which compliance standard to start with? SOC 2 versus PCI versus ISO, for example. Okay. Uh, this is a great question. Um, and if you're just starting out, so I've mentioned SOC 2 and PCI and ISO. Those are specific things. So it's really going to depend on what your business goals are. So when I say security, I'm going to go back to CIS. Um, I really think the CIS are the most grass, most attainable. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there for that. In fact, they offer a lot of free resources just to assess CIS. I really would start with that. So SOC 2, for instance, tends to focus on cloud compliance and has a very specific business goal in mind. PCI, payment card. So if you're not storing, processing, or transmitting payment card, credit card data, you probably don't need to, to jump into PCI. In fact, I would avoid it. <laughs> Unless you have a business requirement to do PCI, I would leave that one out. ISO is a great general framework. Uh, it's huge. So if you're just starting out, um, I definitely would recommend looking through that control uh, set to see what you think of it. But it's big as compared to something like CIS. So um, if you want something that you could look at and go, I think I can do that, CIS is probably there. If you look at ISO and go, wow, that's a lot, um, but I can do some of it, maybe that's that's an approach to take as well. But again, I, I'm going to stick with CIS, I think, from, from my standpoint, I think that's the easiest one to start out with. Um, that would be my guess. Um, if other people, again, in chat, uh, what's been successful for you? I'd love to hear it. All right. We're doing okay with time. That's great. Um, so let's carry on. What is the best solution? Uh-oh, the best solution. What's the best solution uh, to automate security controls 
to be available for continuous improvement purposes. Oh, wow. Risk assessment, maturity assessment, compliance reviews. Wow. Um, so I don't have a best solution or method for this. Um, but if somebody else has something that's working for them, again, throw it in chat. I'd love to hear what other people, what's being, what's successful for other people. But um, I know that there's a lot of GRC tools of, out, of, out there, governance, uh, risk and compliance, okay. no, risk and compliance. So there's a lot of tools out there that help you manage uh, the project. So calendars, documents, controls. So there are a lot out there. I'm not going to suggest one or the other. Uh, there are a lot out there and they vary in price from open source, uh, which has its own price to something that you could pay for. Um, and there's a whole set of those. So GRC is probably a good way to do that because they manage a lot of that overhead for you. But again, there's there's still work there. So uh, calendar events, things like that. Um, I definitely see like Archer, uh, RSA Archer uh, is one of those. Uh, I think No Before has a GRC. There's a lot out there. It depends on how big or small you want. Um, but those um, uh, are helpful for managing that. But that's helpful for automating those sort of like times. Um, and actually, I'm going to, let's see. I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of, of answers to this question, uh, good suggestions. So I'm going to throw those in chat or add those to the forums as well. So uh, there's some great suggestions here. Um, and if you put those actually in the group chat, uh, everybody can see those. So I definitely recommend that doing that. Um, so keep the conversation going there. Um, but let's see. So that's controls and documents. Um, yeah, continuous improvement purposes. Uh, risk assessment. So our maturity assessment. So when I say the 954 model, when I talk about the Verizon payment security report, that has a really good maturity assessment approach. So I do recommend that. And then compliance reviews. I mean, if you've got an annual audit, that's a good uh, trigger there. So you want to make sure that you've got those happening on a regular basis. Um, this is a great question. I think we could spend a whole a lot of time on this. Oh boy, I got lots coming in. So. Um, so if anybody has a best solution, uh, definitely recommend that. I'm going to throw some of these in chat once I get a chance to do that. Um, what's the next question here? Uh, IT, oh boy. So this is not my area of expertise, but I want to throw this question out because if you are in this space, um, somebody, you have an answer for somebody. The best industrial OT uh, to audit environment. Um, this one I don't have an answer for. Uh, I have to admit, I have not had a lot of experience in the industrial space. Um, I do know that, uh, depending on where you're at, like NERC SIP for um, energy, uh, there's there are some things out there that are requirement. Um, but um, I don't have a good answer for industrial uh, to audit environment. So I would say that. Um, a lot of what I've said applies to industrial as well as uh, technology or other or finance or wherever you happen to be in. So the compliance in general, the principles are going to be the same, um, but I don't have a lot of familiarity with, with uh, OT. So if somebody has OT experience, uh, throw that into the group chat. Uh, I'd love to hear that, and we'll add that to the forums as well. Uh, compliance automation. Oh, oh, ha, ha. all right. So I didn't want to make this a sales pitch, but somebody asked, so I'm going to answer the question. So what compliance automation can Tripwire provide in the industrial se sector and what methodology can it be implemented to ensure better governments? Uh, so Tripwire does have industrial compliance solutions um, and they can be automated. Um, I'm not the person to make a sales pitch here, so I'll definitely want to make sure that we get your information. So we do talk about this in terms of industrial, but uh, in terms of industrial visibility uh, for asset inventories, for FIM, file integrity management, uh, for vulnerability assessment, uh, we do have those uh, services and products. So, and those can all be automated. So we definitely want to be, make sure you're automating your uh, industrial visibility. You want to make sure you're automating your, your FIM and your vulnerability assessment. So that's all going to be automated. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and it looks like we've got this one 
covered. So we'll make sure that we'll get back to you on that one because uh, we'll get our industrial experts to talk to you specifically about tripwires controls. We do have those, we do offer those, um, and uh, I'd love to talk about that further. Ah, okay. With so many compliance standards and audits that happen as an organization matures, there are a lot for sure. Have you seen any new methods or innovations with handling audits to be more streamlined or less of a barrier to business? So this is a great question. And I heard something, and I haven't tried this yet, but I'd love to see how it works um, with one of our customers. Uh, they, they told us about this. Um, and I'm actually going to ask our auditor about this. But rather than having an annual audit, they are doing a regular, this is for PCI for them. But I would like to do, uh, see how this works. Rather than an annual audit, they have a continuous audit. So I think they're doing monthly where they're meeting with their auditor and doing a lot of that audit work on a monthly basis so that it's not this compressed two, three, four weeks uh, and intense, but on an ongoing basis. And that sounded really uh, interesting to me because A, the, you've got continuous compliance. You're catching things early. So it's not, oh my gosh, I missed something. Um, I can't make it up. And B, I feel like um, that as an innovation um, allows for smaller increments of work to be done on a regular basis. So that seemed like that could be a really efficient way to go about it. So I'm going to explore that. I thought that was super interesting um, in terms of what uh, could be done in the, on the compliance side. Um, one of the things I think is interesting, and this is PCI specific, PCI is coming out with 4.0. Uh, there was an article about this actually on the state of security that I thought was interesting. Uh, PCI DSS 4.0 looks like a really interesting step forward uh, because one thing I've noticed is a lot of the compliance standards that I'm subject to or I've dealt with um, were written prior to cloud or don't have a cloud mindset. And so we're doing a lot of fitting the spirit uh, into the uh, letter of the law. And so um, I think a lot of the idea is to how do we build in compliance um, and how do we shift that left? Just like we talk about shifting security left in DevOps, building security in early, building compliance in early as well. Um, how do we do that um, upfront? So I, when I did my uh, interface talk for this conference, one thing I said is, if you're implementing a security control or updating a security control, vulnerability assessment, FIM, talk with the implementers early on about what the compliance requirements are and just build that into the implementation. I'm going to need these reports. I'm going to need this schedule. Let's get that built in. And so it's just there from the beginning. Uh, so you're not having to retrofit a lot of that. Uh, and I think that could be true of a dev project as well. We're building a new service in the cloud. Okay, what are the compliance requirements going to be? Here's the documentation I'm going to see. Here are the things I need to see in terms of backup and recovery, scanning, uh, all the things that need to happen. So um, for me, it's like building it in early uh, saves a lot of work up ahead. Um, let's see. I think we're getting close to time. I don't know. Do we? Uh, so if uh, and Liz will let me know. I want to make sure that we're respectful of people's time. Um, I do see a comment, um, and again, throw your, your questions in there for sure. Uh, there's more coming. I don't. It looks like there aren't any more that I see. But business and compliance are not the best friends, um, and uh, that's why I talked about upfront figuring out how do we make them friends. How do we say, look, business and compliance are trying to achieve the same thing really ultimately, right? You want a business that is secure. You want to mitigate risk. Business often wants to go fast, but that incurs a lot of risk. So how do you manage that risk of speed or velocity or uh, doing it uh, without the, the compliance requirements? That, that incurs risk. Um, are we willing to incur that risk? If we are, have we done a risk assessment about that? Um, that's interesting. So um, what else? Let's see. Oh, we've got some great oh, – one more question. Um, what are some of the ways you've built the partnership? Oh, I love this. Okay, 
great question. Between audit, business, and IT, how have you been able to increase the audit appetite? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the first thing we did, like this is probably similar to your journey, right? We have to do this in order to sell our product. If we don't have this, people aren't going to buy it. We have to be, we have to have this compliance, right? PCI, let's say. Um, and so it felt like it was forced upon somebody. It's all this work we have to do. Uh, and so we had, what I've had to do is build in the, like, this is actually helping us sell, right? So if I'm talking like the sales or, or marketing, right? Uh, this seems like it's taking time. It's uh, taking effort uh, or IT. Why do we have to do all this stuff? If I do this stuff, this actually allows us to be more successful on the sales side. It helps us to be more successful on the marketing side. So we have to build in the, what are the collective wins from compliance? Um, what are the collective wins that we get um, to uh, manage uh, this, this process going forward? And how do we do that in such a way that isn't overly impactful to one side or the other? So we have to build in that compromise. There's a great question in chat, uh, one that I struggled with when I started out. So I love this question. How do you start risk assessment? Any templ temp templates you recommend? This one I struggled with when I started out. It was huge. I thought, risk assessment? Well, everything's a risk. Anything can happen. How do I narrow that down? And so um, there's a lot out there. That is a great question. That's probably one that I probably should take to the forums because I want to think about that uh, and, and not be so off the cuff. But um, in terms of starting risk assessment, um, the, the one thing I would say is uh, don't look at your entire enterprise and think what could happen to it that's bad uh, because your I, that, that melted my brain like, oh my gosh, <laughs> anything could happen. A meteor could hit. Um, but what I would say is uh, understand your uh, system, understand the vulnerabilities in, in the system. So one uh, way to start that is simply the vulnerability assessment. Right? Do you have vulnerability scans and what are your highs and lows? So that kind of gives you a, a jump start to understanding what your risk is. But you might have uh, this huge report that says all this stuff needs to happen. So now, well, which of those assets that are being scanned are the most important? Which one has the critical data that you really care about versus uh, this is, doesn't have this anything that is uh, – this doesn't have stuff that I, I care about in terms of, of criticality, but also it doesn't have any access. So that's probably a lower risk than this thing that's high risk. It's on the internet. It's accessible. I need to patch that now. So vulnerability assessment, I think, is a great way to start um, for risk assessment. So that kind of gives you a, a pointer in your direction. Um, also, in terms of uh, what tools are out there, um, so... Uh, what tools are out there? So there is, um, I think, Audit Tools uh, is a website that I've used to kind of kickstart that. Um, so audittools.com, I think, is what that is. Uh, there are some uh, resources out there. CIS has some tools that helps you assess. Um, and there's another great question about um, risk. Like, should it be asset-based or service-based? Um, uh, I'd say debate, uh, go, uh, throw that in the chat. What do you think? I would say um, off the top of my head, and I, I reserve the right to change my mind, I think I would probably start with assets only because I would start to think about where is my critical data held? Is there anything that has payment card data? Is there anything that has PII, uh, uh, anything that could, could identify uh, a person, right? personally identifiable information. Is there any HII, so health information, right? Uh, anything that holds that, is there, what are the critical assets that are holding my data and how do I protect those? So I'd probably start with that. Um, however, um, I can make an argument for service as well. So is this service critical to your business? And what happens if this service goes down? Would it shut your business down completely? Would it would you start incurring fines if that service goes down because it's a financial institution? So I would say there are two different approaches, um, but ah, I love Louise's uh, answer there. Um, define the context. So I think that's probably gets to what I was saying there in terms of 
So context is great too. But risk assessment, I think is a, we could have an entire talk about risk assessment because I think risk assessment is huge. Um, and there are entire courses about that. So I think that's a great question. Um, I hopefully uh, answered some of that, Rodrigo. And again, uh, group chat, uh, definitely you've got some stuff there. The forums um, on this thread, if we want to keep that going, I think we can have a great conversation there too. So we can build a community where we're actually able to answer these questions with each other um, because an hour to cover this huge topic isn't a lot, but hopefully uh, we've done a little bit to make us better. We've learned a little bit of something here. Um, let's see, do we have time? It looks like we've got maybe, I have 10 minutes left in the hour. Um, I don't know. I know we have some housekeeping uh, at the end. So do we have any any more questions? Maybe one more. I'm not saying anything else. Um, one thing I do want to say is thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate uh, the conversation that's going on in chat. Thank you so much for participating. I really that. I appreciate that so much. Um, you are, are experts. You have experience as well. So don't sh uh, don't sell yourself short. Um, we all are, are learning here. So I appreciate that. Um, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to see this group chat going and the forums, because as much as I can offer, uh, I only have my experience uh, and you've got yours. So I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. And I will turn it back over to Liz then. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for a great event. And thank you to our audience for attending. We hope that you found the session informative and useful to you. If you'd like to receive proof of attendance, please respond to the follow-up email that you'll receive at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, and I do have a few people to follow up that had questions, so you'll be hearing from me at the end as well. As part of today's event, we are giving away three Tripwire swag bags for attendees today. Um, so I use my little number generator and uh, congrats to, to Philip J, Juan C, and Stephen L uh, for winning the swag bags. I'll be reaching out to you later this afternoon. We do hope that you'll join us for future Tripwire tips and tricks sessions. Uh, make sure to check out our website at tripwire.com to see upcoming events. Uh, thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.